Regardless of age, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, political persuasion, or any other diversifying factor, porn can impact anyone. If you've recognized the harmful effects of pornography in your life, or recognize the harms pornography can cause on society, we welcome you to become a fighter. As fighters, we strive to be bold, understanding, open-minded, and accepting. If you're ready to become an official fighter, we invite you to join the movement at ftnd.org forward slash fighter. That's ftnd.org forward slash F-I-G-H-T-E-R. Join us in our fight for love by becoming a fighter today. My name is Garrett Johnson, and you're listening to Consider Before Consuming, a podcast by Fight the New Drug. And in case you're new here, Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science, facts, and personal accounts. As we sit down with experts, influencers, activists, and people with personal accounts, we cover a wide variety of topics that may be triggering to some. You can refer to the episode notes for a specific trigger warning. Today's episode is with James Lawrence, also known as the Iron Cowboy. He broke multiple Guinness World Records early in his triathlon career, but he didn't stop there. He went on to complete arguably the most impressive endurance feat ever performed when he finished 100 full distance triathlons in 100 days. James is an anti-sex trafficking advocate and has used his platform to shine a light on the dark corners of sex trafficking. But this is a unique episode because the focus isn't specifically about sexual exploitation. The focus is on the limiting beliefs that each of us can hold. It's likely you've been negatively impacted by your limiting beliefs. Whether you're a person who has unwanted porn consumption, someone who is currently in the porn industry but wanting to transition out, or a parent who is unsure if you can actually have difficult conversations with your kid. The truth is you can overcome your challenge with unwanted porn consumption. You can transition out of the porn industry. You can have healthy conversations about the harmful effects of pornography with your kid. The reason that I feel this is an important episode is because James can inspire each of us to confront our limiting beliefs and redefine impossible. During this conversation, we talk about why James is dedicated to the fight against sexual exploitation, how to overcome limiting beliefs, and why the first step is to believe in yourself. With that being said, let's jump into the conversation. How are you? Amazing. How are you? Doing great, man. I saw you had the mustache, so I had to get mine ready too. Appreciate that. <laughs> Trying to match your energy. <laughs> Love it. Well, I want to start off with a little story, James, because I think it will help you better understand like why we have this podcast. The name of the podcast, as you know, is Consider Before Consuming. And this story, again, it might help you better understand the purpose of it. When I was in junior high, my buddy and I were walking home from school and we saw this speed trap, like these cops were at the bottom of this hill and they were, yeah, they were speed trapping people, pulling people over. And there were multiple cars pulled over as we walked past them. And then we had this idea, like, let's go home and make a sign and go notify people of this speed trap. (laughs) So we went home, we got some cardboard, a big piece of cardboard, and we made this sign to notify people of this speed trap. And we went to the top of the hill, just, you know, beyond the the vision of the cops. And we held this sign up and people were like honking out of like celebration of like appreciation for us notifying them that they're about to get pulled over, you know, and then they'd slow down and... You know, I think I, I kind of refer to that as like the most altruistic thing I've ever done in my life, <laughs> you know, and not, not really, but in reality, it was kind of selfish as well. Cause my buddy and I were having a great time, but we were helping people be safer and we were helping them avoid this speed trap at the same time. And I hope this podcast does the same thing when we, when we're talking about the podcast, consider before consuming, I hope that it kind of acts as a warning to the harmful effects of pornography so people can make an educated decision regarding pornography where, and then it gets to you, like, why are you here today on our podcast? And the reasons why we wanted you on the podcast is because one, you are the iron cowboy, James, 
And also you're dedicated to fighting sex trafficking. So we appreciate you being here today, James. Yeah, thanks, buddy. That's a fun story. Um, I, uh, I, I tried to do that on a very smaller scale one time. You know, you can, you can flash lights at people coming at you to let them know oh, there's right. a cop coming. Uh-huh. Um, well, I flashed um, a highway patrol men coming the other direction <laughs> and he turned around and he flipped his lights on and pulled me over and i got a ticket um oh, for e- illegal use of my headlights oh, um, so so i was i was penalized for my kindness so i didn't have the the same yeah. same satisfaction <laughs> that you received for trying to um help others avoid the speed trap <laughs> you notified the wrong team there i did yes <laughs> Well, um, again, we're excited to have you on the podcast today. And as I'm thinking about this podcast and like the purpose of this episode, specifically speaking, I think that it goes without saying, once people learn about you, if they haven't already, you are a person who inspires. Uh, You are a person who has redefined what it means to do something that is considered impossible. And I think that that can be a very, very helpful thing. Uh, for a lot of people. And most of our listeners are, they fall into different categories and we have a wide variety of listeners, but sometimes they're going to be parents who are other type of caregivers. They're going to be people who are currently in the porn industry um, who want to transition away or who are considering the harmful effects of pornography. Um, Sometimes some of our listeners are going to be former performers, people who have left the industry or people who have been trafficked Um, another one is, you know, people with unwanted porn consumption, where they have this habit that, that has developed and they're wanting to change, make a change, but they think it's impossible. And all of these scenarios are very tough scenarios to be in. And again, going back to you, like you redefine impossible and it can be a very helpful, like that inspiration can be very, it can be a spark for other people. Right. I think what's what's cool is, um, you know, you you hear growing up that everybody has unique gifts and talents, and that it's um, we should share those gifts and talents. And growing up, I was like, man, that person is an unbelievable singer. I don't have that talent. And I'm like, oh man, that person's super funny. I don't have that talent. Or man, that person's super athletic. I can't do that. That person's got talent. And for the longest time, I was like, man, this sucks. I don't know what my talent is. <laughs> And, um, and then during the actual Conquer 100 campaign, I figured it out. Um, and, and, and on the surface, it would seem like this is a, a totally useless talent. Um, but I have um, a gift of suffering, um, a unique gift to be able to endure pain, endure boredom, endure whatever it is. And again, on the surface, it's like, oh, that's, that, that's the crappiest gift anybody's ever gotten. I'm glad, I'm glad you have that and I don't. But the reality is, is um, over the course of our journey, we, we get emails, messages, hundreds of them, um, of people telling us their story, um, the struggles that they're in, the, the adversity that they're facing, and, and they're suffering. And a lot of times it's not intentional suffering like victims of sex traffic. They're not, they're not intentionally suffering. It's just a burden that they, they are currently bearing. And, and I've realized that our team's ability to intentionally suffer gives people hope on their journey where they're not intentionally suffering. Ooh, and so like although that. on the surface, it looks like, man, that's a really shitty gift. <laughs> um, but, but, but it, it, it's a, your perspective changes when you receive messages of people that are dealing with um, unwanted adversity. Yeah. Um, it gives them hope on their journey knowing, okay, if, if they can continue to press forward, facing everything that they're facing it gives me the courage to, to show up and fight one more day. Yeah. And it was, and, and we may or may not get into it, but it is the reason we did one Uh We didn't have to, uh, but we wanted to, to really showcase at a high level that look, I get it. You're broken. You're defeated. You don't know if you can get up and do one more. Yeah. Um, I, I felt that was so important on our journey to get up and do one more when we, when we didn't have to and continue to suffer. Wow. Um, with, with the, with the hope, Um, that it gives people hope on their journey. Um, I I love that the gift I get to give people is hope and I get to remove um, excuses and, and, and possible entitlement from them. Um, And that's a, that's a, that's a beautiful gift exchange. 
um, that gets to happen because of our team's willingness to intentionally suffer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Again, we live in this weird time, this very unique time of history where the comfort, like the ease of access to comfort is wild. And unprecedented so love, is yep. what it is. Yeah. I love that you were talking about intentionally suffering. And then the other thing that I caught, you said that you discovered this ability to suffer in, and you said you did, you found that ability during the conquer 100. Mm-hmm. challenge and i'm just like i'm wondering why did it take you so long because you already did before the conquer 100 you had already done 50 and 50 and 50 did you not discover that talent during 50 and 50 and 50 as well no so i realized it was a talent and an ability but not a gift that benefited others okay and so i i've had i've had the understanding that i had this ability but didn't look at it as a gift until the hundred where it really became apparent to us the impact that it was having. Um, you know, because a lot of our a lot of our journey has been most of our journey has been highly um non not publicized. It hasn't been in the public eye. We have a, you know, we have our pocket of falling. We're not mainstream media. We're not pop culture. We're not any of those things. And so w- when you're suffering in silence and and in solidarity to begin with, you don't realize it's a gift until you get an audience and that audience is being impacted by your ability. And then you realize, Oh, this is, this is something I, this is something I have that I can give others. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes is that a spark starts a flame. And like you're saying, like that inspiration, you, you and your team are the spark for a lot of people. So Again, we're excited to have you. And speaking to sex trafficking again, I know that you're a person again, dedicated to, uh, fighting sex trafficking. And I'm wondering if you can talk to that a little bit, like there's a lot of misconceptions out there about sex trafficking. I wonder if you can speak to some of the ones that you held before, you know, dur- doing further investigation and better understanding this issue. You know, we, we've always tried to associate our challenges with, with charities and philanthropic and awareness. And, you know, we, we've raised money for building dams in Africa. And then the 2015 campaign was, um, to try to bring awareness to the the childhood obesity epidemic. Um, You know, people don't realize that we're the first generation ever where the parents are slated to outlive the kids because the kids are so sick and dying. Um, And that's, that's a, that's a terrible, excuse me, realization at the time I had five young kids. And so that was kind of like my world as time moved on, you know, six years later, we go to tackle the hundred and they sat down with my wife and I was like, Hey, who, who, who do we want to raise money for? And she was like, look, I really want to, tackle the, the sex trafficking issue. We've got four teenage girls. Um, and, you know, as we started to discover and go down the road, I'm like, this affects my teenage son as well. Um, and then, and then adulthood. And once you really start getting into it, it, it impacts all of us. And, and it's, it was less that, you know, our kids were at risk of being taken in sex trafficked. Um, but it was that the U S was the number one consumer of it. And and that was a huge eye opener too. Like you don't have to be um, a victim that way, but you're, you're contributing to the problem by being a a mass consumer. And with the U S you know, the U S is like, ah, that's not a problem here. Like we we're not dealing with that. Like our, our people aren't being taken in traffic. It's the other countries and we don't know how to solve that problem. Well, the reality is, is you're probably the head of the problem because you're the, you're the culture and the society that is consuming it and almost normalizing it. And, and that's where, that's where kind of my eyes were open to, like, it's not just foreign teenage girls that are, that are massively being impacted. It's, it's everybody. Um, And, and, and the, the, that's like, if you eliminated consuming, there would no longer be a need for it. And so I think, I think that's a whole other conversation too. Um, And, and it's, from my understanding and all the s- studies and so, like, it's an, it's an addiction. It's a problem. It's like a, a chemical reaction in the brain. And so, so it's not just like, Hey, you're X, Y, Z because you consume X, Y, Z and you're the problem. I, my realization was like, look, this is a disease and, and we have a consumption problem as a, as a society. And that's contributing to the desire or the need to create the, the product. Yeah. For it. And so that was, that was kind of a huge eye opening for me that, um, that the, that the U S uh, specifically was the number one consumer 
of this product. Right. Yeah. And it's tough to get accurate numbers on like consumption. I'm, I'm referring to pornography consumption. Now it's tough to get numbers, like true numbers in regards to how much consumption there is in the United States compared to other countries. But there is some evidence showing that we are a much higher level of consumption as a country. Um, and so again, yeah. And, and pornography is one of the fuels of sex trafficking. And so, um, I admire your wife wanting to fight sex trafficking and, and yourself as well for the efforts you put forth to bring awareness to Thank this you. issue. Um, well, let's jump into kind of who you are and your brand conquer 100 and iron man. Um, sorry, not iron man, iron cowboy, James, I guess it all started off because of kind of the iron man thing though. Right. Because originally you were yeah. doing iron man's. Yeah, for sure. Actually, the first two world records that I broke were specific to the, kind of the brand Iron Man. And, and I, we're actually the reason why Guinness had to come out and separate brand racing and the distance. Because right. a lot of people don't know, like Iron Man is a brand. They are a company owned by the World Triathlon Corporation. They're like Band-Aid for bandages. They're like, right. clear, uh, you know, Xerox for print machines. They have just become the household name like people say hey pass the heinz well it may be a different brand of ketchup but that just right. becomes you know you know what, what what we consume um or what is so normal and so they've just done such a great job of marketing it that guinness eventually had to say okay look it's no longer an iron man world record it's a right. full distance triathlon because that's what it is yeah that would be like a brand like owning the distance of 26.2 you right, know? it's a marathon. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right, but they've just done such a great job of marketing it and creating these terms. So they own the word Ironman. They own the word 140.6. That's the distance. They own 70.3. They own half Ironman. Like they own all of these words, and they're very, very strict with with public use. Yeah. On those, and and so it's it's hard because that's now become public perception. But the reality is, is there's four standard distances in triathlon, sprint, Olympic, half and full. And each of them kind of double in distance as you go. And the full is the Ironman distance. And the Olympic, it's called the Olympics because that's what they do in the Olympics. But basically it doubles each time. So sprint, Olympic, half and full. And, and my journey, it did start with tons of sprints, like explosive fun racing. And I loved it. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, as you gain experience and knowledge, you go, oh, well, I want to try an Olympic. Hey, I want to try a half. Well, I, what's the what's this whole full Ironman thing? And slowly got into that. And um, again, trying to raise money for charity and have an impact. Just said, okay, what's the man? Ironman racing was so fun. I loved that challenge. What's the? Is there a world record for the most half Ironmans done in a year? Because that's where I thought I should start. And ultimately, did twenty two half Ironmans in thirty weeks. And that was the beginning of our journey. And we broke that world record. And then we were like what's the full Ironman world record? Wow. And, and it was, it was, you know, 20 in, in a year. And I was like, oh, I could do 30. I know I can. And so we just Damn. way in over, way in over our head. And we just started on that journey. And right near the tail end of that, that full Ironman world record, it was 30 Ironmans, official events sanctioned all around the world through 11 countries. And I just, at the, right near the end of it, race 27, I only had three to go. We were really confident we were going to make it. And we did, <clears throat> but right at the end of that, you know, you, it's interesting because when you're in the middle of a fight and you're in the middle of a battle, it's the hardest fight you've ever fought. Right. And, but when you, when you win that fight, more becomes possible. And the analogy I like to use is like, we're all climbing mountains and we're all climbing the hardest mountain we've ever climbed when we're climbing it. But when you summit that mountain, because you've chosen to face adversity, to overcome, to make sacrifices, all of a sudden you're standing on top of that mountain and you can see a bigger mountain that you couldn't see before because you were on the other side of the current mountain you were climbing. Now, when you're on the top of the mountain, another mountain's there. And now that mountain becomes possible because you've gotten knowledge and experience from the one you just climbed. So right at the tail end of the 30, I was like, man, that wasn't that that was hard when I was in the middle of it. But now that I've accomplished it, it wasn't that hard only because I'm different, because I've gained knowledge and experience. And I wanted to find out, okay, now what are, what are my limits? How many, how many of these could I do? If I did 30 in a year, how many consecutive could I do? And at the time, the record was five. It was like this big race, epic five, five Ironmans, five days, five Hawaiian islands. And I was like, whoa, there's no way. That's insane. But then I started to think about it. And I was like, well, I just got to slow down a little bit and pace myself and put the right team in place. 
And then I was like, but I, I, I'm pretty sure six would be easy. 10 doesn't scare me. And then I was following Dean Carnassus, and Dean is an ultra runner. I know Dean actually. No, I don't know him personally, but I read his book. Yeah. And he did 50 marathons, 50 days in 50 States. And the, the endurance world was like, what? That's the most crazy epic thing ever. And I was like, man, if the world reacted that way to marathons, what would it, what would they do if I did an Ironman <laughs> in 50 days in 50 States? And so at the end of 2012, Guinness second Guinness world record. I was like, that's the project. That's what I'm going to put on the table. And for two years, that just is all I thought about. And I was wow. like, we're doing this. And I trained as hard as I could. I, I, I spring vaulted my, my fitness from the, the 30 and that world record. And I was like, this is it. I we're doing 50 in a row. And we just started to figure it out logistics. And I had little kids and I was like, dude, it's going to be awesome. Summer vacation, throw them in a motor home, Sonny Joe. It's going to be amazing. That's my wife. And, and we're going to do this. We're going to set sports history and uh, just, you know, everything was chaos and controversy and, I mean, we were going down a road that was just so uncharted. Nobody had done it before. Nobody even right. close to doing what we were trying to do. Right. Um, and we're not perfect. We made mistakes, but we continued to press forward. And uh, documentary currently on Amazon Prime. We've got the book Redefine Impossible. And um, and so yeah, that's what brought us to to the the fifty consecutive um, world record attempt. I haven't read your book yet, but I have watched the documentary, mm-hmm. and it was a very cool documentary. Very, very cool. Yeah, we're, you know, we did the 100 and we're in the process of editing that documentary right now. And and I should really start writing the second book that's supposed to come out at the end of this year. Uh, we've just been, we've been so busy with, with everything else. Kind of get on that. Yeah. Going back to Dean Carnassus, man, he is the person that inspired me to do a hundred mile race. Yeah, dude's inspired and a lot of people. He was running and, and like, from what I remember from his book, it's been a while, but he was like ordering little Caesar, not little Caesars, like round table pizza and eating it as he ran and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Him, him and Rich Roll. I mean, Rich Roll is a good buddy of mine, podcaster. And um, same thing was, was a depressed alcoholic uh, attorney, I believe. Um, and just walked out his front door and started to run. Yeah. And before you know it, he'd, he'd run, run a marathon one direction and said, sweetheart, and my wife, I need you to come pick me up. Yeah. And he did the same thing. He was so hungry. He just ordered a pizza and gave him the coordinates on the side of the road and consumed yeah. the whole thing. And yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty similar stories. Remarkable, remarkable people, pioneers in, in what, in, in, you know, what we do today and um, just good friends of mine, uh, rich role, especially. That's uh, cool. Yeah. Well, when I think about you, James, I, the word that comes to mind is grit. And, uh, I'm just wondering what your, what your, uh, what your opinion is regarding grit, because I'm wondering if you think you were born with grit or do you think that the grit developed through your experiences? Yeah. So, so grit to me is just, it's mental toughness, right? It's, it's how, how can you manage the conversations in your head? How can you show up in the face of adversity and continue to push through? Um, how do you uh, make no excuses and own the journey that you've been on? To me, all of that is grit. Um, it, it's, a, it's a tough word to define because everybody's level of grit is different, like you just said. Um, I do think you're born of it, um, a certain level. Um, and then, like anything, it has to be cultivated. Um, Shaquille O'Neal, uh, Michael Phelps, uh, Simone Biles. They were all born with very, very specific talents and gifts. If they chose to do nothing with them, they wouldn't be the champions they are today. Same thing with grit. We're all born with a certain starting point, and then it's on us to develop and cultivate those gifts. And when you pay no attention to it and don't apply it and don't become uncomfortable intentionally, don't show up and all of these cliche things, um, you, your, your, your grit meter will stay super low and it's only, you can't, you can't listen to you and I having a conversation. You can't listen to, um, Goggins nonsense rambling. You can't listen to a podcast. You, you, you have to show up on your journey. You have to move. You have to have an experience and at a certain point in your journey, you have to be backed into a corner where you, you're broken. 
And then you have to display the right amount of courage and grit and walk out of that corner. And that's when you're starting to gain and build your grit. Mm-hmm. Um, and only that it's only through experience um, that you, you can have to take the step. Grow. Absolutely. You, you have to, you have to go on a journey and you have to continually um, show up on that journey, partake in that journey. Um, right. And if you're unwilling to, you will stay at whatever level of grit, grit or toughness that you're currently at today. Yeah. In, in fact, in fact, it, it'll, it'll decline. It'll get worse and worse because you will start to be defined as this person who isn't showing up and that becomes who you are. Right. It's almost like we're not on this level ground where if we just don't act, we stay there. We're on a little bit of a, an incline. And if we don't act, we just start rolling back. And I guess it goes back to like growth versus decay. Right. Yeah. We're, ne- we're never just standing still. Yeah. We're either progressing or we're slipping backwards unintentionally. And so if you find yourself standing still in life without a desire to, to grow, adapt, progress, you're not standing still. You are mm. slipping backwards. Yeah. Well, I'm curious how, I don't know. I'm looking, I'm thinking back on your experience. Cause you said that you got some inspiration from like the five Ironman deal. And then you looked at Dean Carnassus, what he was doing with the 50 and 50 and 50 with the marathon thing. And then you come up with this 50 and 50 and 50, but it's with, again, with triathlon, with full distance triathlon distance. I'm just wondering, like, as you conceived this idea to do 50, 50 and 50, did you doubt yourself? Did you question if you could finish that? No, no, never. Um, I didn't, my team didn't. And, and I think it's because um, we, we went into it with 300% conviction uh, and, and also a lot of naivety, having no idea how complex or how difficult or how chaotic it would be. And, and I think that is always a blessing in disguise because how many times have you done something difficult and said, man, had I known how difficult that would be, I probably wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have done <laughs> for it. Sure, for sure. Even though I'm great, even though I'm grateful that I did do it. Um, so I think there was always that element, but as soon as you even start to think that not possible or looking for ex- reasons or excuses to, to back out, you're in a lot of trouble. And anytime something happened, we were always like, okay, it was never a, a panic mode. It was um, puzzle solving mode. And we became master problem solvers at figuring out what we were doing and how do we navigate this current situation. It's totally uncharted territory. Nobody had ever done what we were doing um, to the scale that we were doing it. And, and I mean, it was me and my five kids and my wife and two wingmen. I mean, that's all we could, that's all we could afford. That's all we could convince to believe in us. Uh, but th- that team was so solid um, with so much belief and conviction um, that there was never a moment of trying to talk somebody off a ledge to continue and to not quit. It was like, okay, so-and-so needs a minute. <laughs> we're going to give them five minutes to feel. They're going to process it. And then we're going to rally back together and keep going. Um, but it was never a, oh man, you don't, you don't, don't quit on us. You know, it, it was never that ever, ever, ever. Yeah. I guess that shows the importance of, you know, having the right team and kind of relating it to the listener. It's like who in your life believes in you and who in your life is holding you back, you know? Well, because... and, and, and the reality is, is nobody is going to believe in you until you believe in yourself first. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, you know, sometimes you hear the story of like, you know, I'm so grateful that so-and-so believed in me. It sparked my belief and, and that, that that's going to happen. And you're going to have that exchange. But at the end of the day, that could kickstart or, or flint your, your beginning, but it doesn't matter who believes in you if you don't believe in yourself. So take that spark and then you have to light your own flame and you have to believe and you have to create that belief system and that tribe around you as a leader. And until others really buy into what you're doing and believing in what you're doing, it has to start with you. You have to have that really deep rooted belief and conviction. And I look back on a lot of the video interviews and stuff we did leading up to the 50 and, and it wasn't, it wasn't intentional, but if you listen to a lot of the words I was saying, I would say, no, I, they, I would always get asked, what do you, what do you think your chances are? 
and my answer was always 300%. And it was like, so, so much confidence. Like I, wow. I was, I was offended that they were asking me what my chances were because I didn't understand the question because I was so bought in to the fact that we're doing this. It's, it's just how it's going to look and feel, but right. we're, we're, there's no question that's on the table. We'll see you in Utah in 50 days. That's cool. That's really cool. Thanks for elaborating on that. Yeah. You are the one that has to take the first step. That's, that's an amazing concept an empowering concept. So then five years later or six years later, I don't know the exact duration between your six. two main events. Six years later, you decided to double the quantity of the full distance triathlons that you had done from 50 to more than double to 101. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think this the, is the a- goal. The goal initially was hundred. <laughs> okay. And it then was, what happened? It, it was, it was, it was never one-on-one. So, so really, you know, we've, we've never run, we've never hid from the mistakes that we made on the 50. Uh, they're in the documentary. They're in the book. I talk about our own podcasts. You know, we were pushed inside because of a hurricane. I crashed on my bike and spent a few mi- a few miles on an elliptical machine. And, yeah. you know, the, the people on the outside looking in exploded about that. And we made a decision to not give them any power to continue on. And um, there's very valuable lesson in all of that. But for years, I was just like, oh man, I wish, I wish, I wish that mistake wasn't part of my journey. I wish I didn't, you know, mm-hmm. I wish that wasn't in blogs and conversations. And I wish people didn't have that perception of myself and the team. And for years, I was like, man, I wish I could redo the 50. But I never wanted to redo the 50 because it was hell. And then the pandemic hits and my calendar gets wiped clean and literally like just, just kept getting the impression. Now's the time. Now's the time. Like, go. And it was 100. And so we start. it was a, f- I mean, really fast four month training block after taking six years off of being competitive. Wow. And everything leading up to the 50 was all building upon each other. Well, you take, you take five years, six years off, all those building blocks are gone and you're starting at square one. And I, I was really, you know, I had four months to get ready for this 100 because I was like, this is my opportunity. My calendar's clear. Nobody's doing anything. The sports aren't happening. Um, the public is craving content right now. And this is an opportunity for me to reset my history and, 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 and make, make my path, make, make some adjustments to my past. And, um, so real quick, four month training block, got the sponsors I needed on board and the team, I got them all recommitted and back in and just really did as much, much work as I could in four months. And I was relying on my experience, my mental toughness, my grit, um, previous campaigns, um, and quickly got into trouble because I was going to use the first half of the hundred to, to as training and building blocks. But I mean, you go from almost zero to a full four month training camp and then imagine 140 miles a day, what that mileage looks like. Um, it's just, it's a recipe for injury and disaster. And I went into the first day of the hundred with an ankle injury that I told nobody about. In fact, I'm having surgery on that ankle this month. And, um, and that was just the start of start of problems. I mean, five days in, I've got a picture of, I'm sitting on my fireplace mantle at home and um, but man, my legs are just completely swollen. I'm in incredible pain. And I was just like, Oh man, here we go. Yeah. And I'm staring down, I'm staring down the barrel of, of 95 more, more Ironmans. That's, that's a quarter of a year, Shoot. quarter of a year, 14,000 miles to go. And you're just thinking, Oh my hell, I'm broken. Um, but I've made a commitment. And then that, that's really when the journey starts, right? Like five days in and you, you, you realize like, we got to figure, we got to figure this out yeah. and what, ad- what adjustments can we make? And this is, this is now it's initially, I was like, dude, I'm going to, not only am I going to do the hundred, I'm going to showcase my athleticism. I'm going to throw down some times and then everything changed because of what my body was giving me. I mean, I was, you know, 39 to 45 um, th- those are years where, you know, if you're not careful, you can slip into, <laughs> into some, some stagnant problems and some weight right. gain and all, all those things that I was dealing with. And again, I was just trying to rely on experience and knowledge to get me through. And, and really that is what got me through because my body was broken. And when you're, when you're broken five days in and have that realization that you've committed to a quarter of a year, more of 140 miles a day, um, that's, that's gut checked. Like that's when you're like, okay, what, what does my word mean? What did I commit to? What am I willing to sacrifice? Um, And I was like, dude, if I quit on day five, we've accomplished nothing. And we ended up figure figuring it out and fighting and we raised over half a million dollars. And that would have never happened had on day five. I was like, yeah, hurts too much. 
you know? Yeah. So one of my questions is regarding limiting beliefs because it kind of sounds like you've never had limiting beliefs regarding these couple projects. Like they was you, like you said, like your answer was 300%. Yep. Did you ever experience limiting beliefs with the 100, with the conquer 100? Um, God, it, it, it's hard to say because when you're in the middle of something and you're all in, it just, it's just problem solving mode. It's like, okay. I, I, you know, moments become unbelievable. And they're hard to conceptualize, which is why you have to break things down smaller, become very present, not look at big picture stuff. Um, well, how do I solve this moment right here, right now? Right. And, and I think that's what most people should learn how to do is to, to reverse engineer everything okay. um, and, and eliminate those, those, those belief systems that we have. I think one of the most important things that people can realize is our past doesn't determine or dictate our future. And every single day, we can create a brand new belief system um, through intentional meditation, through study, through uh, mindset shifting. Um, your past does not dictate who you are in the future. It is who you were, or it is is moments that you've had, but it isn't who you are. And you, you, everybody has an opportunity every single day that you wake up. It's a beautiful thing. Every single day you wake up and you have a blank white piece of paper. And every single day you can either add to the direction and the beauty that you want to go, or you can pause and start to slip back into you. But your past does not dictate who your future is. Every single day you get to choose who you want to be yeah. and, 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 and how you want to roll it out. And so that, that's, you know, and I'm talking our culture, United States of America, opportunity is all around us. I'm not speaking to a global audience here. Right. I can't speak to cultures I don't live in, experiences that, are, that I, I'm not privy to. I'm specifically talking United States, Canada. That's where I grew up. Opportunity is is around us, and we do get to choose. Yeah. Well, one of my uh, favorite phrases is that moments of bliss are not free. And I'm wondering if out of all of the experiences you have with endurance events, if there is a moment of bliss that stands out to you as your favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously day one of the 50 day, 50, the 50 day, one of the hundred day. 50. I mean, <laughs> the first and the last 50, day, first and last days, you know, because there's the beginning of every journey is loaded and, and filled with excitement and anticipation and possibility. And then the middle, the middle is chaos, confusion, adversity, triumph, um, ups, downs, valleys and peaks and all these things. And then, and then there's that special moment when you achieve the goal and yeah. you, you, you're there and there's that true bliss. Um, I call it a moment of exhale. Uh, the moment you prove to yourself that you did what you said you were going to do. It has nothing to do with proving anybody wrong. It has to do with proving yourself right. Um, and, and there's a lot of power in that. And so, so for me, those moments of bliss are the beginning of any journey because it is, it's so filled with excitement. I mean, yeah. how, how many, how many times have, uh, have you realized in your life that like the, the drive or the flight to Disneyland was more exciting than the Disneyland <laughs> experience itself yeah. or the, the thought, a notion that Santa Claus is coming tonight was greater than the moment that you open the gifts and you have them. Yeah. The um, build up. Yeah. That makes sense. It's, it's, a, it's the build up, And so it's the, the, the anticipation of how great something can be. Those are, those are fun moments of bliss. Um, yeah. It's like that every, you know, it's like that every single race I do. I'm like, I love the training. I love getting excited. I love getting to their start line. And then in the middle of the year, like I've retired every Ironman I've ever done in my life 200 times. And I'm like, this <laughs> is never stupid. doing this like, again. What are we doing? And then you cross the finish line. And you're like, when can I do that again? Right. And yeah. it's that, it's that, it's the buildup in anticipation. And then it's accomplishing the goal. And then whatever's in the middle of that is whatever it is. Um, yeah. But I think those are the moments of bliss and what we experience in between it allows us to really appreciate both those moments of anticipation and triumph. Yeah. I like that. We have three kids and my wife, after the first delivery, you know, she's like, never again. Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, maybe one more, you know, similar thing there. Well, you've talked to this a little bit already, James. I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more because you talked about that one step, right? Though you have the day one and then the, the day that you finally prove yourself right and all mm -hmm. this time in between. 
So I'm wondering if you can talk to um, doing the small things right, because that's something that you, I, you know, I followed you for a long time now and um, on social media. And I feel, I feel like that's one of the things you talk to often is doing the small things right. Yeah. The secret to success. I get this asked all the time. One, how do we, how do I become more mentally tough, show up, have an experience Two, what's the secret to success. And the answer to that is doing a lot of little things consistently over a long period of time. Um, it, it's not, it's not how fast and how spectacular you can do something. It's, it's how consistent can you be at it to make the impact? And it's, it's the whole theory of 1%. If I can get 1% better every single day, man, how powerful am I going to be a year, two, three years before? Um, I just had a, a friend of mine um, was extremely successful. Uh, and I was like, man, I want to, I want to be that dude. Um, and then made some poor choices in his life, ended up losing everything. And uh, almost as a 50 year old um, coming out of rock bottom said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to become a doctor. Always wanted to be a doctor. And so he, he went back and is now in his clinical portion of becoming a doctor. Wow. And again, it's his past doesn't dictate his future. And at any moment in time, it's never too late to start. And it's never, it's never too late to become a better version of, of who you are. And a lot of people, I think, you know, they, because it doesn't happen overnight, um, both both the slippery slope to to failure and disaster doesn't happen overnight. That, that's doing a lot of little things wrong over, over a long period of time. You wake up and you're like, how did I get here? Right. And the same same flip side to that is like doing a little, little a lot of little things. The next thing you know, you wake up and you're like, oh shit, I'm a doctor. <laughs> that's amazing. Right. Yeah. And so doing a lot of little things consistently, people say, Hey, what's the one thing you do for recovery? And I'm like, Pfft. I do 40 things for recovery. It's not one <laughs> thing. It's all of the things on top of it. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, how, how did you become to be able to do what you do? Well, it, it's, it's nutrition, it's recovery, it's swimming, biking, running, it's strength training. It's, um, you know, all of these different facets. And that's, I think why I love triathlon so much is because there's so many facets to it. I love golf. What makes a great golfer? Well, you got to be a great driver. You got to be a great iron player. You got to be a great wedge player. Hell, you got to be a fantastic putter. Like it's not just one thing. It's so many things that you have to pay attention to, but they can just be little. They don't have to be these big monstrous things. Do little tiny things, but do them consistently. And there's a compounding effect, compounding effect to greatness. Have you ever calculated how many inches you traveled? Nah, no. <laughs> I just had that thought. And I don't know if this math is correct, but the number is really big. I just did this math as you were talking because I was like, you're talking about all these little steps, you know, and we say the 140.6 and we're like, oh, that's the distance. But then you're breaking it down to every second during that 140.6, you had to keep pressing forward. Mm -hmm. And it kind of shows, yeah, like those little moments, consistent, staying on, on track. And then you end up doing and conquering 100. So. Yeah. The, you can't go from zero to hundred. There's a, there's a bazillion steps in between zero to a hundred right. and without, without, taking each one of those little steps, you can't get to a hundred. Yeah. I think that and, relates to, Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and, and that that's truly how you get anywhere is you just break it down to one manageable step, do that, break it down to the next manageable step, do that. And, right. and people are so overwhelmed and anxiety and depression and all these things. And it's all really real. Um, but, but those are emotions mm -hmm. and, and people are like, Oh man, I have anxiety. No, you've experienced anxiety. Anxiety can be overcome. You, you, you don't be defined by anxiety. It's not who you are. It's an, it's an emotion and a feeling that you're feeling. You, you aren't an anxious person. You've experienced anxiety. You experience it, yeah. And don't, don't buy into the belief that that's who you are. Now you have to take it a step further and you have to figure out how to overcome that emotion. And there's so many free tools and uh, uh, resources out there for us to participate in. And, and so I just, I, 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 I have empathy because I've, I've gone through it. Um, but, but I encourage people to invest in themselves and invest in their journey and try to break down those feelings and emotions to overcome them. You aren't, anxiety isn't who you are. It's what you're experiencing. Now you have to figure out how to overcome that anxiety and depression.
Right. Yeah. Easier, Very, easier said than done. I get that. Right. It's a complex thing, but yeah, you're right. And sure. The like that concept can vary it can the application to other areas of life like this doesn't just have to do with endurance events kind of like what i mentioned at first our listeners we have a wide range of listeners and each of them are you know in in their situation and their situation may be very very challenging but taking that first step and continuing forward towards your goal is a very empowering thing Mm -hmm. um you mentioned just barely, you said, you know, I have empathy because I've experienced that when you're talking mm-hmm. about depression or anxiety or there's those challenging the mental health side. Mm-hmm. And anyone that follows you on social media knows that you have grit. And I also love that you are open to uh, the mental health side, like the struggles that you have had and maybe currently continue, I'm sure continually do have because we're, we're all human. I'm just wondering if you can talk about a time when you were struggling with something related to your mental health and what you did to navigate that. Yeah. Coming off the hundred was, was a huge example of it. I mean, you talk about a slippery slope and death by a thousand cuts. Um, you wake up on day one Oh two and, and your whole world has been turned upside down because you were so uh, mono-focused for a decade, yeah. you know, and, and, and now that you accomplished that goal and the journey's kind of over, it's like, what's next. And is that the only thing that defined who I am? And, and then, you know, multiple concussions and bike crashes and the power of the mind protecting yourself from the trauma that you've been putting it through. Um, You wake up one day in a complete brain fog and you're depressed and you're sad and you have no idea why. And um, it's a journey. And I I looked at the resources I had and um, thankfully there was a access to incredible uh, cognitive therapy doctors here. And, um, an entire process that I went through and was able to have my brain reset, um, which is crazy science and technology. And um, was so grateful I had access to that and was able to 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 get to the other side of that. Um, and, and I think there will be a day where it's going to be more accessible to everybody. But there's free apps. Luminosity would be one where you can do brain games and and relight up or light up pathways in your brain that right. re-engages you. And I think the worst thing people can do is sit in darkness in solitude. Um, th- that is your fastest track to increase anxiety and depression, um, sadness and loneliness. Um, one of the best things I did for myself during post 100 was to get outside and just start to move. I wasn't trying to hit speed marks. I wasn't trying to hit goals. I was just getting up on the mountain and moving. Yeah. Um, I, I, I believe that motion creates emotion. And a lot of us, uh, the worst thing we do is we isolate ourselves. The pandemic has done terrible things. I've said from the very beginning, this pandemic will impact people financially and and mentally more than it ever will physically. And that doesn't demean the the deaths and the the tragedy that has happened, but I think it'll be a greater impact. Right. You're just Um, considering all of the negative impacts. For sure. And I I think uh, one that they weren't considering is isolating everybody. and and increasing um, that depression and loneliness and solitude. I think human connection is incredibly important. Right. Um, Embracing someone, uh, interacting with people. Um, I'm so tired of Zooms, man. Uh, Yeah. Not, not, not engaging and getting out and doing tri camps and, you know, so the best thing I did after the hundred, because I was experiencing that situational depression and anxiety and um, was to get outside. Yeah. And just breathe fresh air and take yeah. in sunlight and reconnect to the earth. And um, it's just, it's just something that we're not doing. We're not slowing down our daily hustle and bustle routines. We're not taking a minute to sit in silence and be in thought. Um, and then surrounding ourselves with really positive, great influencers in our lives. I think all those things are important for, for our mental health. Right. Yeah, the brain is a powerful thing. And the fact that it has that neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to change and adapt, it means that today is a day that, like you said, every day is a blank sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there again, going back to like your tips, as you transition from the Conquer 100 into, you know, not doing that anymore, the tip of getting outside and moving, like movement can be medicine. And 
there's a lot of research out there that shows that it can be causal and elevating, like improving mood and decreasing anxiety. So getting out and move, man, that's a great, that's a great. I, I would, I would challenge anybody that is experiencing current sadness and depression to get outside and move. And, and man, I, it would almost be impossible to not feel better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cool. just, just the connection to the earth and the the sun and the rays and the just being outside. Uh, worst thing we can do is sit inside in darkness. Yeah. Well, you know, as we come to the end of this conversation, uh, we just want to leave you with the opportunity to have the last word during this conversation, James, if there's anything that you, you know, would want to share or discuss that we haven't talked about or something else that you would like to, you know, emphasize uh, now would be the time to do that. We'd love to hear those last thoughts that you have. Yeah. You know, I'm passionate about a lot of topics and I, I get to travel around the world and, and share messages of hope. Um, and, and I think that's really what I want people to have is courage and hope to, to get out of their comfort zone and, and to experience life. Um, this, this life's purpose is to um, have experiences, experience joy, experience pain. I mean, the only way to do that is to go do all the time. How do I find my passion? Well, dude, stop trying to find your passion. Just kind of experiences and your passion will find you. Um, yeah. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest questions or one of the questions I hate the most is how do I find my passion? Dude, stop looking for your passion. Go have experiences. And so maybe that's my challenge. My final thought is, is there's no better place or time to start than right now. Nobody ever starts the expert. No, you can't go from zero to hundred without taking the first step. And you have to, you have to start. You have to believe in yourself and just go have an experience. And that's when you're going to gain knowledge. That's when you're going to meet people. That, that's when you're going to blossom. And so that that's really my challenge is to to be okay with who you are today, and to just start showing up on your journey and be consistent with it. And you'll be shocked, man. You're, you'll be a different person at the end of 2022 if you decide to to show up in your own journey and you will you'll regret it. If you get to December 31st of 2022 and you're still sitting there looking back going, what if, who could have I been had I started? And so just, just start today. Awesome. Well, how can we support you? How can our listeners support you? Oh man, we do. We do so much fun stuff. Um, and, and really it's, it's supporting us by allowing us to help you on your journey. <laughs> allowing us to help you get started. We, we just launched a fitness app. It costs one dollar, um, and you can you can gain access to it through our Instagram, Iron Cowboy James. Um, and just if your journey's starting there, it's not about triathlon; it's about fitness. It's about moving because that's going to make you feel better. And you know we've got so much cool stuff coming up, and you can find all, out all about it on our webpage, IronCowboy.com, or through our social media at Iron Cowboy James. But just a couple of things: uh, February twenty eighth, the end of this month, we're, we're launching a sixty day triathlon challenge. Tons of fun prizes, races. Um, coaching groups. We've got a mindset um, camp. It's going to be um, for triathletes, but um, more mindset focused. Um, and yeah, we're just doing tons of really fun stuff, really cool stuff. Um, camps, adventures, retreats, all with the purpose to give back, to help people experience what we've experienced, having the knowledge that you have to have an experience in order to, to change, adapt, and grow. Right. And so, yeah, just follow us on uh, Iron Cowboy James and uh, a lot of information is going to be on ironcowboy.com. We also do a lot of speaking if you want to hire us to do that. Um, but everything is geared for, for our ability to, uh, to help others achieve their goals. I'm um, going experience some of what we've had an opportunity to experience on our journey. Awesome. Well, again, going back to my favorite quote, that quote that says, you know, uh, a small spark lights a big flame and uh, you and your team have been a spark. And now it's up to the listeners to, go and act on that spark and continue and press forward so james we know you're busy we appreciate your time today awesome man. thanks Garrett. looking for a way to spread awareness on the harms of porn why not rep the movement in one of our conversation starting teas with over 20 teas in various designs and phrases you're bound to find something that speaks to you and will spark conversations with others and the proceeds help to mobilize this movement get your gear today at ftnd.org forward slash shop that's ftnd.org forward slash S-H-O-P. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. 
Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects using only science facts and personal accounts. If you want to learn more about today's guest and the conversation we had, you can check out the links included with this episode. Again, big thanks to you for listening to this conversation. As you go about your day, we invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming. 